I'm Lenord, a married middle-aged man, and I'm here to share my story. I have a wonderful wife, Maria, who is two years younger than me. Our family consists of a 16-year-old daughter, Julia, and a 14-year-old son, Melvin. At the beginning of this story, we were an ordinary Scandinavian family living in the suburbs, happy with our average job and modest home. Life flowed smoothly and without any hitches until the fateful Thursday in November. Unfortunately, I got the flu and decided to spend the day in bed, but my wife Maria, who started her day half an hour later than me, looked quite normal and went to the bathroom to take a shower. I was taken aback by the fact that she took clothes with her to change in the bathroom. My surprise increased when I heard the sound of the door closing. Now that curiosity was aroused, I headed to the kitchen drawer to get the door unlocking tool from the outside usually used when children accidentally lock themselves in. After waiting a couple of minutes and hearing that the water was turned off, I finally opened the door. The sight that greeted me in the bathroom was truly breathtaking. Maria was wearing a new set of seductive black lace lingerie and drawstring stockings that I had never seen before. Curiosity got the better of me, and I couldn't help but ask her how she chose this secret and alluring outfit. Why such a drastic change? And why hide while you're getting dressed? I asked, unable to contain the intrigue. Assuming that we were talking about a potential romantic interest, I asked further. Do you have a lover? Caught off guard, Maria froze in place for a moment with a worried expression on her face before answering. Don't be silly, she replied. You should know that Lena and I plan to go shopping at the mall after work today. It may take a couple of hours. Feeling unwell and having flu-like symptoms, I regretfully replied with a sharp refusal. Is it appropriate for a woman to wear a secretive and seductive outfit while shopping for clothes? Or is it more suitable for her when she sells something without wearing any clothes? These questions angered her, and she screamed, Are you accusing me of promiscuity? I'm not accusing you of anything. I just noticed that today, for some unknown reason, you're dressed like people with a dubious reputation. She kept shouting, How do you know how people with dubious reputations dress? I shouldn't have left Ronnie for you. Ronnie Skog was her ex-boyfriend, and although his business as head of the department was very successful, Maria sometimes exclaimed in anger that she regretted leaving him for me after he cheated on her. When Ronnie was fired for using the company's credit card at a number of expensive continental hotels for corrupt women during his trips to the company's international meetings, she stopped thinking about him. I noticed an unusual expression on her face when she froze for a moment, which indicated that my question had touched a deep chord in her. Intrigued, I decided to gather more information and began my investigation in our home office where Maria diligently kept and organized all our financial documents in folders on rings. It took me a long time, but in the end, I found several clues that hinted at a hidden problem. Our joint visa account did not contain any surprises, but after carefully examining the accounts from her personal account, I came across several unusual and disturbing details. Maria and Lena went shopping once a month, usually on a Thursday in the middle of the month. Surprisingly, none of their purchases were made on the appointed day. Instead, they did their shopping a day or even a few days before their planned hike on Thursday. But I was stunned when I discovered that one of these days, Maria stopped at a Q8 gas station located outside the city. I was puzzled why she would go shopping so far if there wasn't even a small grocery store or cafe for motorists at the gas station, but only a motel. I suspected that the reason for Maria's secretive behavior was that she stayed in one of the inexpensive rooms at the gas station, which were rented to tourists, traveling salesmen, and those who were looking for a cheaper alternative to a hotel room in the city. Although I firmly believed that Maria was cheating on me once a month under the guise of shopping, I lacked concrete evidence to confirm my suspicions. The gas bill alone was not a substantial enough reason for a divorce, at least at the moment. So I decided it would be wiser to wait until the Christmas and New Year holidays to meet her face to face and use the remaining time to find out the truth about her infidelity. I thought it would be fun to add a little excitement to our shopping trip today. 
Unfortunately, the liquor store in the mall was closing at 6 p.m., so I decided to call Maria on her cell phone at 4.20 p.m. After several calls, she finally answered, asking worriedly, Has something happened? I replied, Yes, something happened. Are you still at the mall? She replied, a little embarrassed. Of course, yes. Why are you asking? I explained, I need a service from the mall. Which store are you currently in? Her tone seemed a little relieved when she replied, I'm in Victoria's Secret. Why would you want to know that? I replied, I need a bottle of whiskey to treat the flu. Obviously, it was more important for her to stay with her lover, regardless of his location or activity, than to quickly go for whiskey. When she returned home empty-handed, she simply apologized, explaining that she had been too late in the department and the alcohol boutique had already closed by the time she arrived. I expressed doubt by asking what could have taken so long at Victoria's Secret. I even asked to see the receipt as proof. At that moment, she realized that she had been caught in a lie and angrily replied, I paid for the clothes with my own money. Why on earth should I show you the check? The receipt shows the time of purchase of your damn thing, and you know perfectly well that it is needed to replace a defective thing. And you, you damn lying bitch. After my fight this morning, you just didn't want to do me this little favor. She regarded the last statement as a chance to get out of the problem, which is why she said, It's weird of you to expect any favors from me even after you called me slutty when I was getting dressed in the morning. Smiling, I asked, Did your lover agree that you're damn attractive in that new black lace-up outfit? If by any chance you cheated on some despicable person, please remember that in our marriage, cheating is grounds for divorce. That remark provoked the most violent swearing I've ever experienced. I can't deny that I was struck by Maria's impressive acting skills when she pretended to be offended. Her proficiency in swearing made a lasting impression on me. There was a rather cold atmosphere in our house that evening. Although it was obvious that Maria had done something behind my back, I still needed to find out the details of what she had done, where and with whom. Her mobile phone could hold the most important information, and we both owned phones of the same model and usually charged them in the kitchen. One night, when everyone was already asleep, I secretly swapped our phones, discovering that her phone was still connected to the charger. The next morning, Maria went to work without any confrontation, leaving me in bed. Taking advantage of the opportunity, I started an investigation on her phone. Among the meager contents, I found only a single text message accompanied by a mysterious phrase, There will be a photo soon. The sender's number was unknown, since the phone book consisted solely of the records of her closest friends. I couldn't find any information on the internet about the phone number I was looking for, which allowed me to conclude that it was a prepaid phone but my luck turned when I unexpectedly received a notification from my phone. To my surprise, it was a recently taken photo of Maria in seductive black underwear. The sender of the photo was the same as in the previous message. The enclosed text consisted of only four words. Darling, you were great. Although the sender's name was not specified, the exceptional artistic and technical quality of the image confirmed my suspicions. I knew only one person who had an amazing ability to take photographs of exceptional professionalism. This man turned out to be Oliver Erickson, the husband of Rebecca Erickson, one of Maria's closest childhood friends. Oliver gained a reputation as a talented photographer and once, drunk in a pub, boasted of an almost identical picture of his female colleague. Personally, I have never had much sympathy for him primarily because of his tendency to brag about his achievements, considering himself superior to everyone else. I was convinced that he had similar feelings for me. It was easy to imagine how much pleasure he must have derived from silently ridiculing me every time he had an affair with Maria, who was undoubtedly more attractive than his own wife. But still, one question nagged at me. How could Maria allow herself to be seduced by such an arrogant and self-satisfied man? With Christmas and New Year's Eve only a month and a half away, I decided to sustain my marriage throughout the holiday season and maintain an inconspicuous presence. 
This did not mean that Oliver would be able to avoid the consequences. Retribution will surely befall him. Once again, my afternoon was filled with a flurry of business. What I saw made an indelible impression on me. She looked incredibly young and alluring. Oliver, that nasty guy, undoubtedly captured her beauty on his camera. I was even more annoyed by the pleased expression on Maria's face, which suggested that the photo was taken after their intimacy. My next task was more difficult. It took a lot of phone calls to arrange for Oliver's retaliation, which was scheduled for Monday. Being familiar with different people in my hometown, I knew that I could rely on them to achieve the desired result. I was completely convinced that the rather high price was quite justified. But when Maria returned home from her job with my mobile phone, she was far from thrilled. Her displeasure only increased when I screamed and accused her of taking it. I deleted the photo from her phone, which probably led to confusion when Oliver asked her about it. I kept quiet and hoped that they would decide that something had gone wrong when he sent the photo. The first part of my revenge unfolded the following Monday, when Rebecca, Oliver and their children went about their business. A huge amount of manure, about three tons, was taken out by a tractor with a cart and dumped on the lawn in front of Erickson's house. Due to the sub-zero temperature, an unbearable stench quickly permeated the surroundings. The presence of signs advertising the sale of manure only aggravated the discontent of the neighbors. It is not difficult to imagine how an angry Oliver turned to the police, which led to a heated argument when the authorities did not consider a pile of free manure to be a malicious crime requiring urgent attention from all their forces. During breakfast on Wednesday, I came across a funny sight in our local morning newspaper. In a prominent place was a photo of Oliver standing proudly next to a sign advertising the sale of manure. As expected, he grumbled at the police, who only asked him to fill out a form regarding his problems and assured him that they would be dealt with in a timely manner. I couldn't help but burst out laughing, which made Maria wonder about the source of my amusement. I couldn't resist telling him that Oliver, a rather unpleasant person, had found his calling in the manure trade. It is safe to say that he has found his niche. Maria snatched the newspaper out of my hands and I couldn't help but laugh. But to my surprise, she didn't share my amusement. Instead, her face turned red and she screamed at me, You must be crazy if you find this funny! I held back a smile and replied, Don't you have a sense of humor anymore? A dumb and cruel joke can be funny. It's a truly hilarious combination. Rebecca is one of my closest friends. How dare you, despicable man, laugh at her sincere difficulties. Now I was shouting back. Am I to blame for Rebecca's unfortunate decision to marry the stupid and worthless Oliver Erickson? Is it my fault? Perhaps she is deeply jealous that you are married to a real man. But Maria's reaction at the table, or lack thereof, indicated that she might not agree with my feelings. I had the feeling that my wife's love for me had diminished, if it existed at all. In addition, Maria fell ill with the flu, which completely eliminated any thoughts of intimacy with Oliver for the next two weeks. I decided to use my free time by carefully examining her car for any evidence of her affair with Oliver. Unfortunately, my efforts have not yielded any results. Deciding to get to the bottom of the truth, I purchased an ultra-modern mini voice recorder and installed it in her car unnoticed. But while she was recovering, none of us made any attempts at intimacy. In fact, Maria and I haven't had any intimate contact since the weekend leading up to her infamous November shopping trip. Now that the time for her December shopping trip with Lena was approaching, I couldn't help but recall my previous accusations of her questionable behavior. I hoped that this time she would be smart enough to refuse to meet Oliver. It was obvious that he had an important place in her life, which prompted her to take a risk. As expected, we had a fight in the morning when I mentioned that I had an appointment with the dentist, which made me leave the house a little later than usual. Maria accused me of trying to spy on her, hinting that I wanted to know what kind of underwear she would choose for a shopping trip. 
She was furious when I admitted that it would be nice to see her in a less provocative outfit for her peculiar evening shopping trips. In the afternoon, I called Maria just before the end of work to inform her that I would not be home in the evening, but I assured her that her mom had kindly offered to come and cook dinner for our children. As expected, Maria got upset and asked why I had other plans for the evening. I replied, This is a very special mission, my dear. It is of great importance. Our friends have heard rumors about Oliver Erickson, your friend who sells manure. Apparently, he's planning something suspicious in room Q8 with one of his harlots. We intend to keep an eye on both Oliver and the room. I'm sure Rebecca will be relieved when we expose and photograph this unfaithful scoundrel. As expected, Maria was unhappy with my plan. She exclaimed, Oliver, a friend of our family. He has always been a close friend to us. You're being unreasonable. How could you even think of humiliating one of our friends in such an outrageous way? I replied, This man has never been my friend. In the past you have always despised scammers. Why did you change your mind so abruptly about this disgusting bastard? Her response was full of anger. I will always despise cheaters. There is no doubt about that. But I've seen how sincerely Rebecca and Oliver love each other, and that's why I trust their words not the baseless rumors that your so-called friends spread. It's really disappointing how deceitful some people can be. As for Oliver, I decided not to worry about him that evening. I focused on seeking justice, and it seems that Maria, sensing concerns about my call, canceled her plans with Oliver for this evening and possibly for the whole of December. Still, the situation became intriguing as Maria considered her actions for the evening given Oliver's absence. Just the thought of Oliver being followed made Maria lose all enthusiasm for the important monthly shopping trip with Lena. Having imperceptibly followed Maria's car from her workplace, I parked my car at some distance from the house. After attaching the spare key to the car key, I went to Maria's car in the driveway and unlocked it. Taking a small dictaphone, I headed to the nearest parking lot and began listening to its contents. The first recording, in which Maria offers a ride to the house of one of her colleagues, turned out to be uninteresting and frivolous. But the subsequent recording caught my attention. It turned out that Maria contacted Oliver immediately after my call, because there was deep concern in her voice. Maria expressed her concern and informed Oliver that they needed to cancel their planned date. Apparently someone I know found out that Oliver rented House Q8, which made them curious about who he was meeting there. Maria warned Oliver that they were being watched, both him and the house. Leonard is also monitoring the situation. He called me and told me that he would be home late. Although Lenord accused me of infidelity during our last date, he will never suspect you of it. It's much more likely that he'll suspect another woman at your job. Oliver, we can't consider this idea. No way. Refusing to buy him whiskey was a significant mistake that made him understand my dishonesty regarding purchases. Now he doubts me and is actively looking for evidence. I can't afford any more suspicious behavior. I was incredibly stupid to agree to meet with you today. I'm going home right now. No way, Oliver, we can't do that. Not before January. See you at our New Year's Eve party. No, absolutely not. Don't even think about coming to my house. No, absolutely not. Yes, Oliver, I love you too. After talking to Oliver, she called Lena. Hi, Lena. I have to cancel my date with Oliver today. Lenord's friends got wind of the rumors around you and planned to keep a close eye on you tonight. He called me to tell me he was late. Unfortunately, our plans will have to be postponed until January and possibly longer. Goodbye. It is very annoying to discover the actions of such an audacious person. This new knowledge was all I needed. So far, I've just suspected Oliver and even punished him without having concrete evidence. But now, having received confirmation, I have all the necessary evidence. My next step will be to finally resolve this issue. Arriving home an hour later, I went up to Maria and asked if she was already at home. It seemed strange to me that he and Lena managed to finish shopping at the mall so quickly just before Christmas. In response, Maria suggested that it would be ideal if we went together on Saturday in search of Christmas gifts. 
She also mentioned that I returned early from a moral mission, and suggested that Oliver, the unfaithful scoundrel, most likely cancelled their date. It looks like someone warned him. Maria accused me of intervening to protect Rebecca from the scandal, which infuriated her. In a fit of anger, she categorically stated that I should never even think about involving her in my insidious plans. Upon further examination of the accounts stored in Maria's folders, it turned out that her deceptive shopping had lasted since November last year, with the exception of July, when we had a summer vacation. Surprisingly, Maria managed to deceive me at least 12 times, and now it became obvious that their November meeting was a significant milestone for them. This revelation shed light on Mary's extraordinarily attractive outfit that day. Interestingly, my investigation revealed that she made no effort to dress provocatively for their cancelled December date. Consequently, this single cancellation did not benefit her. After learning that Maria cheated on me 12 times, I realized that this is far beyond what any reasonable husband can bear. The love I once felt for her instantly evaporated. Deciding to teach Lena a lesson, I made a plan for the next morning. I sent her husband a postcard with a picture of the best hotel in the city, accompanied by a false message claiming that his wife was having an affair within its walls. Although it was fiction, I knew that such a message would surely ruin their marriage. Christmas was approaching, and Maria and I went through all the holidays without quarrels and intimate relationships. Watching her behavior, I realized that she was not particularly pleased with my choice of gifts since they were noticeably cheaper than those that I usually gave her. In the end, it was time for the New Year's Eve party that Maria and I were hosting. We spent a lot of effort to put our house in order, and temporarily put the furniture in the garage to make room for dancing. In addition, I personally built an improvised bar and bought drinks. Upon the arrival of the guests, I took over the management of the bar and cordially welcomed them with delicious drinks selected specifically for each gender. Rebecca and Oliver arrived and got their drinks, as did everyone else. For Oliver, however, there was a slight difference. His drink included an additional ingredient that I had so hard to get. To my great satisfaction, everything perfectly matched my intentions. As expected, Oliver had a few drinks before the party and did not refuse any offers during the meal. The combination of fizz with other alcoholic beverages gradually led him to fatigue. Maria offered him a little break in our spare bedroom, and even Rebecca agreed that this was a reasonable offer. Rebecca and I helped him get to bed and gently laid him down. Later, when I had the opportunity to slip quietly into the spare bedroom, I found Oliver sleeping peacefully on the bed. Despite the fact that I am not a beer lover, I drank several bottles and my bladder was already at its limit. So, when I relieved myself imperceptibly, I did it as if Oliver had done it himself. I made sure that no one saw me enter or leave the spare room. After some time, I asked Rebecca how Oliver was feeling. As soon as she said she wasn't following him, we went to the spare room together. The acrid smell of urine wafted to us as soon as we opened the door, causing Rebecca to scream in despair. Hurriedly returning to my packing, I loudly informed Maria that Oliver had indeed wet himself and wet the bed. My exclamation attracted the attention of our guests, and several of them began to investigate the commotion caused by Oliver's actions. Undoubtedly, this scandal will haunt Oliver for a long time. Maria initially insisted that I take responsibility for Oliver and help him get home. But my direct response, expressing a refusal to even approach this anxious person, was able to calm her down. Fortunately, one of our more balanced comrades volunteered to show compassion, and, with the help of Rebecca and Maria, escorted Oliver, who was now wrapped in a blanket, to his place of residence. The others continued to celebrate, rejoicing that we had a new source of entertainment. It's no secret that Oliver was disliked in our male company, so his presence caused a lot of laughter, to everyone's surprise. Rebecca and Maria returned to the party hand in hand. The night went on, and everyone raised their glasses to drink champagne for the new year. To Rebecca's horror, all the couples around them were kissing passionately, 
except for her and Maria. Feeling a wave of humiliation, she couldn't resist asking me, Why didn't you kiss me? I replied calmly, Why should I? We're married, aren't we? That's not enough reason to kiss you. The intensity of our argument attracted the attention of others, and they began to eavesdrop. Maria replied with a pained expression on her face, If you really love me, then the first thing you should do in the new year is kiss me. Her face turned pale and ashen when she heard my unexpected answer. We have other urgent matters that require our attention. Maria quickly hurried into the kitchen to prepare a late-night cocktail, and the guests who overheard our conversation stared at me, waiting for an explanation but I decided not to give them and quietly left in search of Lena. I took her to a quiet corner and asked her why she and Maria had missed their monthly shopping night in December. Lena put on an unusual look and replied, Don't ask me, ask Maria. It's just that she called me and told me that she canceled the evening. I nodded in agreement, confirming her words. I wonder if you and Maria went shopping together these evenings? I noticed that no purchases were made with credit cards these days. It seems that she does all the shopping either one or several days before these evenings. I'm interested in this because Maria always said that you go shopping together. It's amazing that you don't seem to know anything about it. I'm sorry if this question upsets you, but maybe it's better to ask Maria directly about her shopping habits. And then Lena's husband joined our conversation who questioned her actions during those staged shopping episodes. He asked her directly if she had had an illicit relationship with someone at the hotel. There is no doubt that my postcard from the hotel caused tension in their family, as Lena began to cry. I want to make it clear that I never accompanied Maria anywhere. My role was only to provide her with an alibi. Whatever actions she has committed, the responsibility for them lies solely with her, not with me. Lena's husband had drunk a lot that evening, and it was clear from his mood that he did not intend to tolerate his wife's deception and excuses. He fixed his gaze on her and said, It's time you started telling me the truth. What the hell were you and Maria doing during those evenings? Sensing that the charade was coming to an end, Lena plucked up the courage and answered, Maria was dating her lover, and I used to go shopping. Lena's husband was astute enough to understand that if he forced his wife to reveal Maria's affair to him, Maria could in return lay out everything Lena had, if any. She turned to her husband, tears streaming down her face as he asked again about the man involved in this affair. Between sobs, she whispered, I don't know. A wave of anger swept over her husband. He raised his voice, warning her against lying. Deciding to put an end to the charade, she finally gave up and said the name Oliver Erickson. Pretending to be surprised, I couldn't help but exclaim in disappointment, condemning him as a disgusting clown with a terrible lack of taste. Depressed by the situation, Lena and her husband decided to leave the party, leaving me to deal with the bar. Maria managed to slip away from me easily, avoiding communication until the late-night cocktail was served. We silently drank our drinks together, without unnecessary conversations. When the last member of our company said goodbye to us, the moment of truth that we had both been waiting for came. Maria, having taken the first step, asked curiously, Why didn't you want to kiss me? And when did these feelings arise? It was obvious that for a long time, perhaps even over the last year, you knew that the day of reckoning would come sooner or later. Unfortunately, tonight, Lena revealed something that I had guessed since the days of my ill-fated flu, when I saw how seductively you dress for a date with your lover. Maria's face paled. Her concern became obvious as she asked, I didn't notice that Lena was drunk, but what exactly did she tell you? I have a strong feeling that she told the truth. I know that your monthly shopping trips were just a cover for secret dates with your lover at the Q8 Hotel. Although Maria was worried, she remained determined and was not going to give up. Curiosity made her wonder, Why, may I ask, don't you reveal the name of this non-existent ghost lover? Sighing heavily, she prayed, Please enlighten me. 
I'm ready to hear the most disgusting truth. Lena's shocking confession destroyed Maria's world. Her lover was none other than the bed itself. In Lena's confession, my suspicions were confirmed. This asshole to Oliver Erickson. Maria flushed with anger and began to scream. Did she mention anything about her own novels? What about Ralph Norman, a retired hockey player? In a fit of anger, she rushed into the bedroom. I followed her, shouting for the liar to leave this room. From now on, she will sleep in the spare room. She protested that the bed was wet. I replied, Is it my fault that your lover is wetting the bed? That's your problem, not mine. Despite Maria's refusal to leave, I managed to push her out of the bedroom. I quickly set the alarm for eight and climbed wearily into bed. My head was throbbing painfully, but I gathered the strength to get up and head to the kitchen for a much-needed cup of strong coffee. The betrayal of that vile Oliver ruined my happy marriage, which was a once-in-a-lifetime happy one, and it was high time for him to answer for the consequences. Determined, I dialed their landline number and to my relief, Rebecca answered the phone. I informed her that after she left the party, Maria's friend Lena told me that Maria and her husband had been in an affair for at least a year. Even Maria confessed this to me. So I decided to call Lena's husband and tell him about Maria's violent reaction when I told her about Lena's affair with Oliver. Maria started screaming about Lena's affair with a former hockey player named Ralph Norman. It may have been somewhat unfair to expose Lena like that, but she played a significant role in the collapse of my own marriage. In the end, I found out that Lena confessed her infidelity to her husband as well. He quickly took revenge on Ralph Norman by subjecting him to a brutal attack within the walls of his own home, witnessed by his wife and children. When Maria entered the kitchen, she realized that her marriage was most likely over, as was her affair with Oliver. I asked, was there really not enough intimacy in your marriage that you felt compelled to seek satisfaction elsewhere? Was your love for this despicable man so strong? Maria shed tears and confessed, I don't like him. The extra intimate moments we shared only added excitement to my affection for you. You are my true lover, and you will always remain so, unlike him. With him it was all about physical intimacy. If Rebecca is shrewd enough to leave this lying man, then you've won. I deeply regret my stupid mistake and I beg you to forgive me. My love for you has never waned. You and only you are my greatest love. He was just a fleeting emotion, devoid of genuine affection. Please find the strength in your heart to forgive me so that we can continue our journey as a family, with our children. Please. I was very inquisitive and made inquiries. How long does this alleged bonus deception last? I've only met him three times and on the first date we didn't have any intimate relationships. We only had two intimate meetings because our plans for December were cancelled by you. It hurts me to see you lying like that. You fell for my trick and missed the supposed shopping when I called about Oliver, since you had already finished it a few days before. Perhaps our marriage could have been saved if you had also missed your November rendezvous, as your new seductive lingerie aroused my suspicions. Asking you for whiskey was a simple trick on my part. I mistakenly assumed that for you, celebrating an anniversary is more important than preserving our marriage. To dispel my doubts, I studied your credit card statements for the past year, especially noting all the purchases made during your monthly shopping trips with Lena. Surprisingly, the only expenditure that was recorded was the cost of gasoline at the Q8 gas station, located outside the city. This discovery makes me doubt the validity of your claim that you had only two intimate encounters. To be honest, I'm sure that between November and November you had a physical relationship with him at least 12 times. One case of deception is no longer acceptable to me. The exact number doesn't really matter, but it would be interesting to understand when, how, and why the cheating started. Maria fell silent and tears welled up in her eyes as she rushed into the spare bedroom. She confessed her infidelity, and I didn't have to disclose the phone records or the photos Oliver sent her. Maria thought it would be better if I got most of the information from Lena at our party. 
Both Rebecca and Lena called Maria on New Year's Eve. It was obvious that these calls put an end to the long-standing friendship between Maria and her two closest friends. Although it was I who revealed the shameful secret of my unfaithful wife, I had only one way out, to become the object of ridicule. Without hesitation, I filed for divorce as soon as the court reopened after the New Year holidays. Maria has never revealed the true motives of her infidelity, nor when it began. The following year, after our New Year's Eve party, turned out to be incredibly difficult for me. Despite Maria's numerous attempts to save our marriage, we finalized the divorce in July. Unfortunately, she chose not to answer my questions about her relationship with Oliver, leaving most of this question in the dark. It is unpleasant to admit that the consequence of Maria and Oliver's infidelity was the emergence of a tendency to divorce, since their affair led to the dissolution of four unions, Maria and me, Rebecca and Oliver, Lena and her husband, as well as Ralph Norman and his wife, who was noticeably younger. Having successfully escorted Oliver out of their shared home, Rebecca wasted no time and began a romantic relationship with her boss. Surprisingly, they tied the knot in August. It was rumored that Oliver had suspicions about their relationship long before their official divorce, which he claimed fueled his affair with Maria. But no concrete evidence of his accusations has ever been found. In the end, Maria reluctantly accepted that we were divorced. With the help of my supportive relatives and friends, I managed to buy out her share of the house. Having bought an apartment with their own funds, she and Oliver decided to cohabit. But their happy union suddenly broke up after just a month, as a heated argument forced Oliver to leave. Rumors of enuresis even forced him to leave the city. As for Maria and me, we now share custody of our children, who mostly live in my house, but sometimes spend time in her apartment. Despite the constant statements that mom doesn't have a romantic relationship with anyone, I don't care. Similarly, I am still not interested in the location and circumstances surrounding Lena, her husband, her lover Ralph, and his wife. I refrained from dating until Christmas, but to my great relief, I discovered that there are many single women who would like to spend the night with someone like me. On those rare occasions when the desire for intimacy led me to lonely bars, I could not help but feel a deep longing for Maria, despite the enormous humiliation caused by her infidelity. But I was too ashamed to think about bringing her back. In fact, it was one of my close friends who convinced me to leave all the negativity at home and go on a trip to Thailand for Christmas and New Year. His cousin, who recently broke up with his girlfriend, had an extra ticket for a charter tour, and I decided to take advantage of this opportunity. Since Maria and I had already planned that our children would spend the holidays with her this year, I had no obligations at home. Therefore, I decided to purchase an additional ticket. Fortunately, this cousin turned out to be a cheerful traveling companion. But our luck did not end there. On the second morning at the hotel, we were pleasantly surprised to find that we were having breakfast at the same table with two divorced twin sisters. This unexpected acquaintance turned out to be the highlight of my whole year, because in the end, we spent the rest of our time in Thailand with these two lovely ladies. Despite the fact that my companion Monica was 12 years older than me, she was an attractive woman with a slender figure. I was incredibly pleased to discover that she has exceptional pleasure-giving skills that surpass anyone I've come across in my entire life. She had the amazing ability to wake me up multiple times during the night, leaving me completely satisfied. When I returned home, I found that I longed for the amazing, intimate experience that I shared with Monica, more than I ever longed for meetings with Maria. But then a problem arose. It turned out to be quite difficult for me to find a job in the French-speaking region of Belgium, where Monica opened her accounting business. Similarly, Monica faced limitations when looking for a similar career in my country. As a result, the only way out for us was to plan trips to Belgium for the weekend to be together. But it looks like my future visits to Monica may be permanently cancelled. When I returned from my trip I found that a new neighbor had moved into the house adjacent to mine. This new neighbor turned out to be a strikingly attractive recently divorced female lawyer who was several years younger than me. 
To my pleasant surprise, she also had a daughter named Joanna, who turned out to be the same age as my own daughter. Given the close bond that has formed between the girls in such a short time, I decided it would be wise to invite Joanna's mother, Madeline, for a cup of coffee. She was a beautiful and calm woman, and I volunteered to help her with various household chores, which led to pleasant coffee breaks after each job. I couldn't help but think about her often, but I decided to act carefully, taking small steps to see if she reciprocated my feelings or just saw me as a handyman. It soon became clear that she had fabricated some of her problems just to spend time with me over a cup of coffee. Madeline must have been her ex-husband's respected wife and probably didn't stay single for long after the divorce. Shy guys often find it difficult to attract beautiful women, and unfortunately, I fell into this category. One Friday, I plucked up the courage and called a stunning woman and invited her to dinner that evening. But she politely declined saying that she was not up to it that day. But she offered to arrange dinner another time, offering to have lunch at a new Greek takeaway restaurant at her house, including our children. Although it was clear that she was not interested in a romantic date, I agreed. Surprisingly, the dinner turned out to be quite pleasant, reminiscent of a cozy family meeting. For me, this was an important step in establishing a deeper connection with my attractive neighbor. After our teenage children left us after dinner, Madeline and I drank a bottle of wine and, sitting comfortably on the couch, started talking about our previous divorces and aspirations for the future. Madeline made the bold decision to leave her ex-husband after she was physically assaulted twice after witnessing similar unpleasant incidents caused by abusive men in her workplace. With a determined look, she met my eyes and delicately asked if I had ever resorted to cruelty with my ex-wife. Honesty prevailed, and I told her that in my entire life, I had never raised my hand against any woman, even in response to Maria's infidelity. I told Madeline about the consequences my ex faced because of her infidelity, which eventually led to four divorces, the loss of her home, husband, lover, and two close friends. This unpleasant situation also led to her being labeled a promiscuous woman, which attracted unwanted attention from unwanted people who tried to start a romantic relationship with her. Subsequently, Madeline asked me about my recent trip to Thailand and whether I had committed any annoying acts that required correction. Although I understood her hint, I pretended to be ignorant and asked for clarification, saying, I'm sorry, but I didn't quite understand your question. Could you clarify what you mean? Obviously, I had a specific intention when she replied, Don't play dumb. I wanted to find out the truth about the man who invited me to dinner. It is important for me to know if you entered into a paid intimate relationship during your trip to Thailand. I want to clarify that I have not been involved in such activities. But I admit that at that time I was dating a divorced woman from Belgium. It is important to note that this happened when I was single and did not meet anyone in my homeland. Madeline asked me again if I had any intention of dating the Belgian woman again. I answered honestly. Yes, we discussed it, but only on the condition that none of us are in a relationship. She greeted me with a radiant smile and asked, Are you seeing anyone? I answered her with my most charming smile. Although I can't say for sure, I'm doing my best to charm a beautiful lady and get a date. As long as I keep hoping to achieve this, I'm not looking for anyone else. Why is this date with me so important to you? Keep in mind that after one date it is difficult to look forward to any grandiose evening because it can be either the beginning of a blissful dream or a harbinger of its heartbreaking end. She spoke with all seriousness, expressing confidence that, despite her initial optimism, Difficulties were ahead of her. After a short pause, she spoke about the turmoil she is going through now in connection with the divorce. She spoke about her desire to find a life partner who would love and accept her, emphasizing the importance of honesty and loyalty. Surprisingly, she noted the fallacy of the opinion that divorced women only want intimate relationships, since she has already received many invitations to dates. I have received many requests for dates, including from married men. So far, I've turned down all but two people. 
The first meeting was a complete disaster and Lenord, you are the second person who caught my attention. But we both need to understand each other more deeply before making any decisions about the future. I cannot ignore the fact that one of your main strengths is that Joanna has a favorable opinion of you, and I also love Julia and Melvin very much. Maybe we should agree that honesty and dedication to each other will be a priority at this initial stage, and make every effort to deepen our understanding before making any commitments regarding our future. I readily, and without hesitation, accepted this offer. Sacrificing a pleasant weekend in Belgium was a small price to pay for the opportunity to establish a genuine connection with Madeline, even if it meant postponing any intimacy until she felt more familiar with me. If you compare Madeline with Monica, then it is unlikely that the physical aspect of our relationship will be equally pleasant. I personally knew several people who were able to create a harmonious family by combining the remnants of two broken families. If Madeline and I sincerely wish the same, shouldn't we make an effort to fix the situation? After a while, the children said that their mother had entered into a new relationship with a mature man who had a bald spot, and for this reason the children did not want to visit Maria, since her new man was not pleasant to them. But this relationship did not last even a year, as he caught Maria cheating. Apparently my ex-wife does not calm down in life, her nature requires thrills and new intimate experiences. It's been eight months since our beloved son Jonathan went to school, leaving Marie and me to explore the uncharted territory of an empty family at the age of about 40. We are proud of his achievement, receiving a scholarship to the University of Oxford. Having become empty nests, we found ourselves in a situation where we needed to rediscover our relationship and start a new chapter of life that did not revolve around our children. Naturally, I assumed that our intimate life would immediately revive and return to the frequency and pleasure that we once shared. But the reality turned out to be different in those first two months. Marie felt a little depressed when her baby started on his own path. At the same time, she was overwhelmed by the realization that she was approaching her 46th birthday with several new wrinkles on her face and a few extra pounds. Personally, I think that all this only adds to her beauty, but Marie seemed to think that life was slipping away from her and that the days of joy and adventure were in the past. After doing a little research, I found that this is common. To support Marie, I tried to provide her with positive feedback, shower her with compliments, and give her the necessary time to adapt to the changes in her family. It took several months, but eventually, Marie found her footing again. When Friday evening came, she returned home from work, overwhelmed with happiness and enthusiasm, reminding me of my wife of more than 20 years ago. Beaming with smiles, she radiated new energy, as if she had been reborn. We spent the whole weekend together, enjoying the intimacy we missed so much while we dutifully carried out our countless duties. Even before I had time to undress, Marie eagerly knelt down, fervently removing my trousers and underwear. This unexpected act was a revelation to me because Marie had never been particularly fond of such caresses, but that night she gladly accepted them, creating an incredibly pleasant feeling. Then she gently led me to the bed. This meeting left me at a loss, I doubted the identity of this mysterious woman. Despite my confusion, I felt a surge of anticipation and desire, feeling a strong desire again. The intensity of her discharge testified to the pent-up excitement that had been building up for years. Every aspect of this experience was new and exciting. Fired up by my own desire, I wasted no time, immediately took matters into my own hands, and for the next five minutes passionately indulged in an intense session. We indulged in passionate intimacy, culminating in a mind-blowing intimacy that left us both in a state of complete bliss, collapsing into each other's arms. Throughout the weekend we enjoyed each other, surpassing all the previous heights that our intimate relationship had reached. When I woke up the next morning, I found Marie snuggled up to me and couldn't help but smile. Good morning, my beauty, I greeted her, still in awe of the incredible night we spent together. 
I couldn't help but express my desire for this enchanting night to continue. Whatever affected you last night, I hope it doesn't end. I love you, baby, I confessed. In response, Marie stroked me passionately, rekindling our desire, and we indulged in lovemaking again before heading downstairs for breakfast. After a long time, I finally felt a revival in our intimate life, which gave me hope for the next chapter of our life together. But I didn't know then that it wasn't my efforts, but a colleague from her job that caused her to have a new desire. Within six weeks, this man from her job began to take a special interest in Marie, showering her with compliments and playful flirtation, which revived her youth and strengthened her self-confidence. Although this had a positive effect on our intimate moments, in the following months it also brought unexpected problems. And yet, after three months, our lives seemed to be on a positive track. From a financial point of view, we had a stable and pleasant job. Jonathan was doing well at school, and our intimate relationship has reached new heights in the last three months. Although the source of her heightened passion remained a mystery to me, I treasured every moment. Every day brought delightful meetings, pleasant nights, and enjoyment of her. It was absolute bliss, and I found solace in the fact that she returned my love, and I fulfilled all her desires. I felt like a confident lover, able to provide a high level of intimate satisfaction. Friday night has always been a cherished dating routine for us. Like clockwork, after a long day at work, we went to the cinema early, and then had dinner at a restaurant. Back home we lovingly entwined in each other's arms, indulging in passionate moments until sleep carried us away. This sacred tradition served as a means of preserving a vibrant life outside our humble home. We both enjoyed these special evenings, trying to recall the essence of the days of our youth and indulging in nostalgia. It is noteworthy that our intimate meetings exceeded the frequency of meetings with peers, and I tirelessly tried to maintain a spark of delight. But on this particular Friday night, she expressed a desire to prolong our afternoon fun with a drink. When she coquettishly squeezed my leg, her gaze, accompanied by a mischievous smile, was filled with the promise of something exciting. She mentioned a new club called The Hideaway, which was recommended to her by colleagues. It was conveniently located just 10 minutes away. Live jazz music was played in the club, creating a lively and exciting atmosphere. We decided to visit him and started the evening with a few drinks at the bar. Marie's affectionate nature seemed to have intensified, charming me even more. Her bright energy sparked desire in me, and I was looking forward to what would happen next. And at that moment, her hand was on my chest, gently stroking my pounding heart through the fabric of my trousers. Smiling tenderly, she kissed me gently on the lips, caressing me sensually, bringing me closer to the brink of bliss. But she mischievously switched her attention, playfully nibbling on my earlobe, and whispering seductive words in my ear without ceasing to tease me. The desire to take her right here and now in the middle of a noisy bar seized me. But alas, our public display of passion abruptly stopped when the band stopped playing, forcing us to restrain our desires. While I was savoring the last sips of my third martini, the band took a break, creating a short pause in the lively atmosphere. It was at this moment that a man I didn't know came up to our table. In a deep, baritone voice he called loudly, breaking the atmosphere of the noisy bar. I must have looked completely stunned as I watched my wife's cheerful expression turn into a worried one, which prompted me to think quickly. Hi Brandon, it's good to see you. This is my husband Charlie, she greeted as he hugged her warmly. A surge of envy swept over me, as if intuition signaled that something was wrong. Despite the state of intoxication, I couldn't help but notice more and more coincidences. The constant joy permeating our house, the sudden appearance of a new bar, and the unusually affectionate behavior of my wife. In an unexpected place, she accidentally crossed paths with a man in the very bar that her friend recommended. Although there was no evidence or cause for concern, I couldn't help but feel a sense of wariness. This man, Brandon, 
looked to be about 40 years old, had a striking appearance and a deep, velvety voice reminiscent of Barry White. One can only imagine the effect his alluring voice had on others. Despite my initial doubts, Brandon turned out to be friendly and engaging, making conversation without difficulty. When we had another drink, my nerves began to calm down, allowing me to accept the possibility that his presence was just a coincidence. After spending a pleasant 20 minutes in our company, the jazz band resumed their melodic tunes. Everything seemed to be going smoothly until he asked if I would mind if he accompanied my wife to the dance. Without waiting for my answer, she quickly got up from her seat and answered, Of course he doesn't mind, does he, dear? Leading him towards the dance floor, she left me behind, leaving me stunned. A flash of anger swept through me when I realized that this situation had been deliberately set up. Despite the temptation to leave her there and go home, I decided to stay and observe the development of events. As I watched, my irritation grew with every passing moment, especially when I noticed Brandon hugging my wife too closely. The way she leaned her head on his shoulder, wrapping her arms around his neck, haunted me. His words whispered in her ear only increased my anxiety. Alarm bells instantly rang in my head, confirming my intuition that something was wrong. Despite the obvious troubles, they returned, dispassionately pretending that everything was fine. To my amazement, Brandon smoothly moved on to a new conversation, as if dancing with my wife was a regular thing. He showered my wife with compliments and expressed gratitude for her invaluable help at work. When he asked about my interests and hobbies, Marie hurriedly intervened and answered on my behalf, leaving me confused. Charlie has a huge passion for football, especially as a dedicated Manchester United fan. He never misses a single game on TV. Charlie, is this information reliable? Moreover, considering that the playoff game is taking place tomorrow, can we assume that you have already arranged to watch it? Indeed, my dear friend Jake and I are devoted fans who never lose sight of a single game. We have already planned to gather at the local pub where we are going to celebrate Manchester City's victory over Liverpool. Well, Charlie, fortune has finally smiled on you today. You see, I recently purchased two tickets to the long-awaited game. Surprisingly, these tickets were generously donated to me by one of my suppliers. But since I am not an avid football fan, I intended to give them to someone else. He took out an envelope and handed me two tickets labeled Tier 1 Centerfield. Amazing places that were known to be unattainable. And yet they were here. Instantly I realized the gravity of the situation. He looked like a snake from the Garden of Eden, holding out an apple to Eve and coaxing her to take a bite. Trying to keep calm, I modestly remarked, Wow, these places are incredible. You should definitely go and enjoy the game. This is not really my topic, my dear friend. I do not intend to use them, so I will be glad if you accept them and enjoy the game. As a friend of Marie, I would be very grateful if you would accept them. And at that moment, anger flared up in me. I was well aware of the situation I was in, but I still reluctantly took the tickets. If he had addressed me as friend one more time, I would have felt my restraint go away. Calming down, I replied, Thank you, Brandon. That's extraordinarily generous of you. Marie and I will definitely have a good time at the game. Anticipating my wife's reaction, I already knew what would happen next. Horrified, she said, Oh, my love, I despise going to these games. You should have gone with Jake. Both of you will undoubtedly have a better time than me. Don't worry about me. I have a lot to do. Therefore, it is decided. You're going with Jake tomorrow. At that moment, I wasn't sure about the extent of their relationship. I couldn't tell if she was having an affair with him or if she was considering the idea of opening our marriage. Anyway, it was obvious that she wanted him, and she was putting me on the back burner. It seems that she underestimated my determination and insight, as I decided to observe the development of the situation. I lacked concrete evidence other than my intuition, observations on the dance floor, and an unmistakable arrangement at the bar tonight. I decided to let the situation develop naturally and adapt my plans accordingly. 
Despite the tempting offers of playoff tickets or money, I stood my ground and refused to share my wife. If she wanted to involve someone else in her life, she had the right to do so. But I would not participate in this game. It was clear to me that Brandon had certain qualities. He exuded sophistication, had a good appearance and a captivating voice. Undoubtedly, he seemed to be a charismatic and accomplished man. As for what could captivate any woman over 40, the problem arose when the woman he was trying to charm turned out to be married and not subject to the ban. Brandon was one of those who took pleasure in stalking married women, enjoying turning their husbands into unsuspecting victims. This vicious game fueled his ego, giving him a sense of power and providing the benefits of casual intimacy. I have long understood his true nature, the embodiment of pure malice. Marie, inspired by the drinks and the time spent with Brandon, did not notice my silence after we left the bar. When we got home, she was incredibly excited, but I was still angry and pretended that I had a headache, blaming it on excessive alcohol consumption. I pretended to be asleep, but I could feel her lying next to me, giving myself pleasure. Although I wasn't completely naive, Jake and I still attended the playoff match. Before leaving the house, I installed two voice-activated voice recorders in strategically important places, which I had purchased earlier that day. In addition, I activated the Find Me app on her phone while she was in the shower, knowing that they both know about my absence. I assumed that they would have the opportunity to spend time together or discuss the events of the previous night at the bar. But to my surprise, she did not leave the house while I was at the game, and the devices that I discreetly installed did not produce any noteworthy recordings. Despite this, my suspicions did not disappear, and I continued to keep a vigilant eye on upcoming events. When I returned home after the game, I found Marie elegantly dressed and prepared a delicious dinner for me. After exchanging a passionate kiss and warm hugs, she led me into the kitchen. How was the game, my love? Did our team win? I replied, Yes, of course. Manchester has won. Baby, I can only imagine how glad you are that you watched the game from these incredible places. Brandon's gesture was very kind, and the places are really amazing. Marie seemed completely satisfied and did not stop smiling all evening. But to my disappointment, from that day on, I couldn't get rid of the constant references to Brandon at work or during their frequent lunches together. Everyone seemed to be constantly talking about how successful he was, about his beautiful cottage on the lake, about his incredible travels and what a really good guy he was. My patience has run out. But one evening she returned home completely delighted and overwhelmed with happiness. She hugged me tightly and kissed me on the cheek. It was a pleasant surprise. I couldn't help but wonder what was the reason for such an affectionate greeting. To my surprise, she started talking about the opera La Traviata, which she had endlessly discussed in the past. I asked the reason for their sudden interest. She said that a performance of La Traviata will take place at the Royal Opera House on Friday. I expressed my dislike for the opera, believing that they would understand my reluctance to go to it. But she insisted on going herself, assuring me that I didn't have to accompany her. This news made me happy, because earlier she mentioned that she had lunch with Brandon. He informed me that he had recently purchased excellent opera tickets. They were provided to him by another supplier, just like the ones he previously gave you for a football playoff game. After learning about my long-standing desire to visit this particular opera, he kindly offered me tickets. Unfortunately, he was disappointed when I mentioned your strong aversion to opera, as a result of which you refused to accompany me. Then he came up with a brilliant plan, offering to fulfill my dream, to watch the opera and treat me to a delicious dinner afterwards. Isn't that sweet of him, my dear? Such a generous gesture. I replied with a touch of sarcasm, noting that she predictably declined his offer. I understand perfectly well that you don't want to go and that's not a problem at all, but would it bother you if I went with Brandon? The reason I see this as a big problem is that it goes against my wife's expectations to go on a date with another man, regardless of whether I'm here or not.
I have to admit I'm very surprised that you agreed to a date at all. I knew from the very beginning that this was planned. I'm sorry I didn't take this as a date. I sincerely regard Brandon as our friend. He generously provided you with amazing playoff tickets, and we had a great time. He even paid for all our drinks, and he was a useful colleague and friend to me. I'm sure you understand why I appreciate him. With a smile on my face, I made the decision to let events unfold and see where they lead us. Yes, he did all this and really seems like a good person, but I have to admit that I'm not comfortable with my wife spending time with another man. I'd rather you didn't go out and get involved in anything risky. But at the end of the day, you're an adult, independent woman, capable of making your own choices. Anyway, you know about my wishes. I felt that she understood my anger and discontent. Well, my love, you don't need to worry. I understand the situation. I didn't want to upset you, and I'll fix it right now. I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings. As for me, I'm fine emotionally, but I'm worried about my wife. She came up to me and kissed me gently on the forehead. Please calm down. I adore you. Besides, it wasn't a romantic outing. So please stop being jealous and let's drop the subject. We did postpone it, but I haven't forgotten. Later that evening when she wanted intimacy, I informed her that I had a headache. After our conversation, I felt incredibly angry and offended. Although I couldn't say for sure if she had an intimate relationship with him, it was clear that she had unknowingly started an affair with him. I knew that if I didn't step in, it could lead to serious trouble. If she had already entered into an intimate relationship with him, I knew that our relationship would come to an end. The situation with Brandon was becoming more and more problematic, and I expressed my growing jealousy of him. I asked her to stop seeing him at lunch, but she resisted and pushed away my request. But you're being stupid, and I won't stop being his friend. If this means having periodic dinners together, then you need to be more understanding. Naturally, I was angry, but I needed to find a way to solve this problem without putting my marriage under even more strain. Soon after, our communication expanded and we started drinking after work. When I asked her about a potential affair, she strongly denied having a sexual relationship, claiming that she just liked his companionship. So you're not attracted to Brandon? Don't lie to me, Marie. All the women in the office are passionate about him, including me. But I'm already in a serious relationship and I don't react to my feelings in any way. But I understand why he attracts everyone. He is incredibly handsome, and his voice is mesmerizing. Still, don't worry. I trust myself, and I trust you. Imagine if I had lunch and a drink after work with someone I craved. I have a feeling that you wouldn't be understanding about this. This conversation did not go smoothly, and as a result, our house became a little chilly for a few days. She was very angry when she imagined that I was having an affair with another woman and expressed her sharp disapproval, making it clear that this was completely unacceptable. Moreover, she warned me that she would take drastic measures if I ever betrayed her trust. I couldn't help but think that she was being unreasonable and not thinking straight. So I got the feeling that our future as a married couple was in serious danger. And that's what happened. One evening, she returned home three hours later than expected without calling me, which made me worried and anxious. But she came into the house as if nothing had happened and came up to me to kiss me, as if everything was in perfect order. I pushed her hard in the back, giving her a piercing look expressing my sharp disapproval of the situation. It's very convenient that you finally returned home. Did you engage in intimate activity with your friend tonight? My wife had never seen me talk to her in such a tone, and she quickly apologized, explaining that her phone had run out and she had lost track of time, promising that it would never happen again. Did you spend time with Brandon? Marie looked away and said nothing. Filled with anger, I made it clear in no uncertain terms that our marriage was hanging by a thread if this behavior did not stop. Marie, I want to make my point unequivocally. If I find out that you had an intimate relationship with him or were somehow connected with him, our relationship will end. 
I refuse to be with a woman who cheats or lies to me. These words made a deep impression on her, and she sincerely apologized, insisting that she had been faithful and promising to put an end to it. For the first time, I truly believed that Marie understood the seriousness of my expectations. She really stopped discussing him and his amazing qualities, but continued to have lunch and drinks with him without my knowledge. The only change was that she no longer shared details about how they spent time together, and how wonderful he was. Two weeks have passed since that incident, and when we sat down to dinner, I plucked up the courage and turned to her. I asked her bluntly if she had really stopped eating and drinking with Brandon. Her response was far from what I expected. Reaching out tenderly, she put her hand on my shoulder and smiled reassuringly, as if I were a naive child in need of comfort. In a sympathetic tone, she admitted that she was still dating him. Stunned, I tried to make sense of her confession, unable to hide my anger and resentment, but it was her next words that swept through me, causing my mind to spiral. In a brazen manner, she said that she did not want to offend me, so she did not reveal the truth, and yet she claimed to love me, as if that alone could justify her actions. Let me rephrase this for you. It turns out that Brandon is just my friend. He recently canceled a date at a corporate dinner. Since we are close friends, he asked me if I could keep him company. Assuming you wouldn't mind, I agreed. But I was taken aback and firmly said that I did not agree with this idea. So no, you can't go with him. Marie, please remember that you are still my wife, at least for now. Charlie, please stop being so jealous and possessive. Brandon is our friend, and he just needs my help. I'm going to go and I hope you can trust me. I assure you everything will be fine. I can't believe she's calling me an old fool thanks to this guy's influence on her. Marie, if you go, our relationship will suffer and I won't be okay. I can't physically stop you from leaving but my answer is no. You shouldn't leave. It is clear that there was no intimacy that evening or in the following week. I barely spoke to her because of my anger and frustration with the whole Brandon situation. She seemed to understand the situation and stopped pestering me with questions about Brandon and the upcoming date. The next day, when I was at work, Brandon called me. It turned out that Marie had given him my number, hoping that he could convince me to change my mind. I made a mental note to tell Marie what I was thinking when I got home that evening. Charlie, my friend, how are you? Brandon greeted me. Brandon, what a pleasant surprise. What made you call? I asked wanting to know what plans this cunning man was hatching. Well, I called to apologize. I'm sure Marie informed you about my request for help and company at my corporate event. Looking back, I admit that this was a mistake on my part, and I apologize if it caused any disruptions at home. I must admit that the situation took me by surprise, and I honestly expressed my feelings to Marie. She assured me that she told you about it. Looking back, I realized that I should have approached you directly and asked for your permission, and not implicated Marie in this case. It would be more appropriate for us to discuss this face to face. I was speechless at this man's audacity. The mesmerizing tone of his voice seemed otherworldly, amplifying my anger. Well, sir, let me make amends and offer you whatever you want. If that's what you want, I can get season tickets to Manchester. Brandon... Are you suggesting that I exchange my wife for a simple set of football tickets? Are you implying that I should belittle the value of my wife to exchange friendly communication for material values? Is that how you perceive everything? Listen, I think you misunderstood me. I don't share my wife with anyone, and if you dare to call me an old man again, you'll regret it. I promise that the next time we cross paths, I will express my dissatisfaction in a more appropriate way. I am quite capable of buying my own tickets, so let's leave this question. Of course I urge you to stop bothering Marie and look for a companion elsewhere. My disappointment was evident in my voice as I delivered my message. He seemed to completely ignore my words and continued his conversation. My friend Charlie. I apologize if my feelings upset you because I really care about Marie and wanted to ask your permission for her to accompany me to my event, hoping for your blessing. I ask you to refrain from directing your anger at Marie. 
I take full responsibility for her desire to attend this event. Therefore, could you reconsider your decision and allow her to accompany me on such an occasion? Brandon, I urge you to listen carefully. No, please stop your persistent questioning. It is quite clear that she will not accompany you. Moreover, I would appreciate it if you would stop having lunch with her and meeting for drinks after work. These actions are starting to negatively affect our marriage, and I think you can understand my feelings. Charlie, I'm sorry if you feel that way, but please understand that we're just friends. I don't intend to end our friendship just because you have certain doubts. I'm sorry that you don't want to do this one favor for me. Despite all the things I've done for you, like giving you those incredible football tickets and offering you a season ticket, you don't seem to appreciate my generosity. I'm upset and angry at you. I have already expressed my gratitude for the tickets, and as I said before, I am able to buy my own football tickets. Now please leave me alone and stop interfering in my marriage. Annoyed, I slammed the phone shut. In the evening, I returned home and found Marie in a very depressed state. When she found out about our discussion, she didn't know how to react. In the end, the prolonged silence became unbearable for her. I was informed about your recent communication with Brandon. Was it necessary to be so rude? You have deeply hurt his emotions. The look she got from me, accompanied by her question about my alleged rudeness, could have frozen our once vibrant pond even in the height of summer. To hell with you and to hell with his feelings. It's intriguing that you put his emotions above those of your spouse. Besides, why did you give him my work phone number? Are you so desperate to be with him? Maybe I should just leave. You can spend time with your new boyfriend, I suggested. I was hoping that you two would form a stronger friendship. You know, so you can spend time together. I apologize for the way things turned out. I didn't want anyone to get hurt. Are you upset? Honey, I don't want to have anything to do with him, and I told him bluntly to stop these dinners and drinks with you. Let's not forget that you are a married woman. It is very important to behave appropriately, otherwise the situation may escalate, I assure you. These words ignited her anger, prompting her to speak out. Please stop acting like an insecure teenager. We've been married for two decades now, and you have no reason to feel threatened. I sincerely hope you're right, because the thought that I've spent the last 20 years of my life on the wrong person terrifies me. When I said that remark, it seemed to have an effect on her, and I desperately wished that she would regain her sanity. But we were silent for the rest of the evening, and our intimacy continued to suffer. In fact, my anger at her actions and words became so intense that I found solace in going to sleep in our son's room in search of solitude. Marie, realizing her mistake, was upset about my decision to move out, and over the next few weeks tried to make amends. She admitted that she had stopped lunch dates with Brandon and was trying to be more affectionate with her husband. Gradually, I began to sleep in our bed again, but I still did not dare to enter into an intimate relationship with a woman who clearly had feelings for another man. Unhappy with this, she persistently tried to arouse desire in me. Deep down, I felt that she was still infatuated with Brandon, and my instincts made me stay vigilant if I wanted to save our marriage. Unfortunately, while looking through my wife's text messages on her mobile phone, I came across the date of Brandon's upcoming event. It's worth noting that none of us had passwords on our phones. I had never spied on her before, so I had no reason to be secretive. But when I read her plans, a wave of sadness washed over me from the realization that our relationship was about to change. The information I discovered also made it easier for me to make my own plans. I wasn't surprised when I realized that her recent affectionate behavior was just an attempt to win me back and distract my attention from the Brandon situation. I realized that my cunning wife intended to reveal a secret to me. She was really going to go to an event with Brandon on the upcoming Thursday evening. This revelation sparked an idea in my head, and I was curious if she would really go for it. Despite the fact that I explicitly forbade her to be with him, I found myself in a dilemma. To solve it, I announced at breakfast the next morning that I had an important meeting in London on the 22nd, 
which would keep me away until the end of the next day. Considering that Brandon's event was also scheduled for the 22nd, I deliberately put her in front of a choice. She could either trick me into attending the event without my knowledge, or she could honestly tell me about her plans. In any case, I have already decided that I will not stay any longer. If she confessed and attended the party, it would force me to move out and start divorce proceedings. On the other hand, if she had done this without informing me, it would have meant the final end of our marriage. Unfortunately, she chose to remain silent and hide her plans from me. Despite this, she maintained the facade of a loving and impeccable wife, giving me delicious dinners every evening, keeping the house in immaculate condition, and greeting me with affectionate kisses on my return from work. But she never once brought up the topic of Brandon and the upcoming event. On Thursday morning I said goodbye to her knowing full well that this would be our last goodbye, and went to my office. She didn't know that I wasn't going to travel to London. Instead, I intended to spend the night at the hotel where the event was to take place. I consulted with a lawyer to arrange the necessary documents for the divorce and set a date for the delivery of the papers. In order for the process to go smoothly, I even offered a higher fee for the services, asked them to be present at the hotel where the event was taking place. I wanted them to deliver the papers as soon as I approved them, which would mean the final end of our relationship. Under the cover of a medical mask, tinted glasses and a baseball cap, I quietly settled down in the lobby of the hotel, watching the front doors and enthusiastically reading the newspaper. As expected, my future ex-wife appeared on the doorstep. At 8 o'clock in the evening, Brandon entered the hotel, accompanied by my beautiful wife. She looked amazing in a little black dress, complemented by dark stockings and high-heeled shoes. It was obvious that she had decided not to wear a bra, as her small breasts were on display. As they exchanged cheerful greetings with others, their laughter filled the air, giving the impression of a loving couple. Although I had expected their presence, such an open observation of their intimate relationship took me by surprise. Despite the outburst of anger, I kept my composure and quietly recorded this scene on my mobile phone. In the future, I planned to tell my son about this, as I needed to explain the reasons for my mom and me getting divorced. While watching her with Brandon, I dialed her phone number and saw Marie glance at the phone to see who was calling and leave the call unanswered. When she ignored my call and turned her attention to Brandon, there was a painful feeling in my chest as if someone had ripped out my heart. At that moment, all the love and years of devotion that I had devoted to Marie seemed to evaporate. Tears welled up in my eyes. Despite my best efforts to contain them, I managed to leave a few desperate messages in a feeble attempt to save what little was left. Hi honey, it's 8 o'clock in the evening. I hope everything is okay because your phone immediately switched to voicemail. I deeply love and miss you. I was hoping that she would hear these messages, feel guilty, and leave the party before things got out of hand. If she had just left or called me to confess, maybe I would have had a glimmer of hope. But that evening she didn't even bother to listen to the messages. I lingered in the restaurant, watching them from afar. It was obvious that her connection with him was deeper than she pretended, as they behaved like a couple throughout the dinner. I was careful and went unnoticed, watching their communication. As the evening went on, accompanied by numerous dances and passionate moments, it became obvious that they were preparing to leave the dinner party. Before that, I had already received information from a text message about his stay at the hotel, and, having offered Bellman a generous sum of 100 pounds, I found out the room number. Kim, the bailiff, Arrived as planned at 10 p.m. and we discussed my actions. Thanking her for her help, I was happy to hand her another 200 pounds. At 11 p.m., Kim and I took the elevator and headed to their room. Kim knocked gently on the door, causing a slight noise inside. I stood at the side of the peephole, waiting impatiently for an answer. A clear voice came from the room, asking about our identity. Showing her pass card through the peephole, Kim confidently stated, 
Security, please let us pass. Although it was obvious that the tenant did not carefully examine the ID she presented, our ruse succeeded. We heard the sound of the door lock being unlocked. Gradually, the door creaked open, revealing Brandon's face before he said a word. I quickly stood in front of Kim and forcefully opened the door, causing Brandon to stumble back and collapse to the floor, completely naked and visibly dazed. A woman's sigh came from the room at the sight of his fall, which turned into a piercing scream when she realized that it was me standing in front of her. It was shocking that liquid was flowing down her legs, indicating recent intimate activity. While Brandon remained on the floor, naked and vulnerable, I resolutely put my foot on his neck, bringing down the full force of my 200-pound weight on his throat. I warned him not to make any sudden movements. Giving a signal to Kim, she went over to Marie and handed her the divorce papers. Kim informed Marie that she had been handed the documents and discreetly photographed her, completely naked, clutching an envelope. Shock showed on her face when I took off my wedding ring and threw it on a wet spot on the bed. Seeing my torment, Marie finally realized the devastating consequences of her decisions. Suddenly she felt longing for me, not for her lover. Unfortunately, it was too little and too late. Charlie, I'm sorry I made a serious mistake. I desperately want to keep you in my life, and I understand that the situation seems terrible, but I want you to know that I still love you deeply and am determined to save our marriage. Please let me come home with you so that I can explain everything and try to make things right again. I beg you not to make this decision. Watching her, I couldn't help but shake my head in disbelief. It struck me for the first time how much older and physically no more powerful she looked. When she stood there naked with Brandon's marks on her body, I felt disgusted. After I saw all this, all my affection for her completely disappeared. All the love and trust I felt for you turned into a deep sense of resentment and disgust. Our marriage had reached the breaking point, which was symbolized by the last scene that unfolded in front of me. I stood towering over Brandon, my foot pressed against his neck, and ordered Kim to leave us alone. When the door closed, I looked at my wife and addressed her in a voice full of despair and rage. It is with a heavy heart that I congratulate you for ruining our two decades of life together. Your actions have broken my heart in the most devastating way. You decided to deceive and betray me, which resulted in intimacy with this despicable man. Our time together has come to an end. Please sign the divorce papers and refrain from returning home until Saturday afternoon. It will take me a day to pick up my things from home. You can stay in our house until it's sold, which I don't think will take long. In the meantime, maybe you'll find a place with this man, I said, removing the boot from his throat and firmly pressing it to the vulnerable groin area. To ensure a reliable connection, I delivered one last hard kick with my heel, confirming my success. I heard the agonizing screams of a man in unbearable pain as I reluctantly left the room after saying goodbye to my wife for the last time. Brandon, the victim of a horrific incident, tragically lost both testicles in an accident. Despite his desire to press charges, I made it clear to Marie that if she testified in his favor, I would expose her infidelity in front of her family by releasing incriminating photos I had. Faced with such an ultimatum, she made the difficult decision to tell the police that she could not identify the person responsible for Brandon's injuries. As a result, Brandon felt furious and betrayed by the woman who had once betrayed me. Despite her persistent attempts to contact me for two months, I resolutely refused to communicate with her. Marie reluctantly agreed to sign the divorce papers, admitting that the marriage could not be saved. In the end, she plucked up the courage and told the whole story to our son, taking responsibility for the death of our once happy years together. We sold the house, divided the property, and went our separate ways. Brandon, feeling hurt and detached, showed no interest in maintaining a relationship with Marie as a new single woman. He bluntly stated his disinterest, urging her to move on and find someone new. Being a divorced woman at the age of 46 was not easy in the dating world. When I discovered that thanks to the manipulation tactics of one lying person, 
I gained an extra 20 pounds and began to look less attractive than I had previously thought. But after spending six months working out at the gym, I successfully lost weight, gained a toned figure, and met a charming 37-year-old divorced woman named Patricia, who had an adorable nine-year-old daughter named Melissa. Patricia had an impressive physique and cherished a devoted and affectionate partner very much, treating me with the greatest adoration. In addition, I have established an amazing bond with Melissa, enjoying the opportunity to pamper her with affection and care. When we attended Jonathan's graduation ceremony at the age of 50, Marie's appearance reflected her years. She was lonely, deprived of communication and unhappy with the way her life had turned out. Jonathan told me about her deep distress when he saw me with my new family. The sight of my blissful existence with my charming wife and beautiful daughter made her feel sad and envious. Marie confided in our son, expressing remorse for her past actions and how badly she treated me. Remorse lingered, and she tried to forgive herself for succumbing to the temptation of that unkind man. When she confessed to Jonathan, she said that my lack of love had brought her to a deep realization. She realized how valuable what she once possessed was, and how much she longed for her old life. The immense pain and sense of loss she experienced were a direct consequence of her own selfish desires. I hope that this lying cheater will spend the rest of her years alone, regretting her actions. As soon as Lisa crossed the threshold of the house, I was overwhelmed by a wave of confidence. It became clear that my wife had betrayed our vows. Despite her claims that she was working late, there was an undeniable feeling that her actions went far beyond her professional responsibilities. What led me to this conclusion? Intuition played a big role, as well as the unequivocal expression on her face and her anxious behavior upon arriving home that fateful evening. Lisa's inability to hide her emotions was like playing poker for amateurs. Despite the fact that I suspected my wife of being wrong, I managed to hide my emotions with the help of a convincing poker face. But instead of facing her directly, I went down an inconspicuous path and hired a private investigator. At the age of 27, Lisa and I had been together for five years, since our senior year of college. Throughout our relationship, I have believed that we share the same values, in particular an unwavering commitment to loyalty. Before the marriage, I made it clear in no uncertain terms that infidelity would be an absolute mistake for me. Until that moment, it was unpleasant for me to realize that I thought our life together was perfect. Unlike those who put their career first and not their partner, I have never neglected my wife. Moreover, I often surprised her with flowers and small gifts so that she would feel that she was cherished. We arranged romantic dates, had dinner and lunch to create an unforgettable experience. In addition, her physical desires have never been ignored since I have a significant intimate attraction. Maintaining my appearance with regular workouts, I received compliments about my attractiveness. Although I admit my shortcomings, taking care of my wife has never been one of them. Lisa couldn't be called a stunning beauty, but she had a certain charm and a well-proportioned physique. Her bust might not have been particularly large, but it couldn't be called small either. She boasted curves in all the right places. As a paralegal at a prestigious law firm, Lisa usually returned home at the end of the day, with the rare exception of late nights devoted to important cases. On the contrary, I thrived in the field of high technology and received a comfortable income. It is worth noting that Lisa came from a fairly well-off family since her father owned a huge ranch in Texas, which fortunately produced oil. At her father's insistence, we had to sign a prenuptial agreement. The document stated that in the event of a divorce, our premarital assets and any inherited property would remain intact. Money was never my motivation to marry her, so I signed this document without any problems. I never particularly liked her father, who held racist views and often made derogatory comments about people of color. But since Lisa didn't have such character traits, and we lived far from her family, it didn't bother me much. I decided to hire the same private investigator that my friend used to gather evidence against his unfaithful wife. 
I was extremely impressed with the effectiveness of this man. But the very next day, after I began to suspect that something was wrong, I found myself in the office of a private investigator and explained my needs to him. As soon as he agreed to charge me in advance, he immediately started working on the case. It took a few days before my wife returned to her usual behavior after what I thought was the first case of her infidelity. All this time, I continued to play the role of a loving husband, and it was clear that she thought she got away with it. Exactly a week later, she called me and informed me that she had to stay at work again. Without hesitation, I contacted a private investigator and informed him of the situation. When she returned home, there was a hint of guilt in her expression. Although not as acutely as before, she seems to have gotten used to the idea that I will remain in the dark and she will be able to behave as she pleases. The next day, the investigator called me and confirmed my suspicions. She entered into intimate relationships with her colleagues, and she did it right at the workplace, after everyone left for work. It is alleged that he managed to take several photos through a window from the building opposite, although they were not quite clear. He asked me if I wanted him to keep running the case, and I asked if he could get video evidence instead. He said it was possible, but the price would be higher. Since I was not in a financial predicament, I assured him that the cost was not an issue and instructed him to act. At that time, I fell ill with a stomach virus, which prevented me from becoming intimate with my wife. At least that's what I told Lisa. I couldn't help but worry if I had contracted venereal disease from her. Despite this, I started to implement my plan. Admittedly, one of my shortcomings is my addiction to playing poker. From time to time, I would gather with friends to play, and as a rule, I would come forward. I considered myself a good amateur. I also participated in online poker games. It was a simple matter to buy games for $5 and $10. Our savings amounted to a little over $200,000, and given my significant contributions, I did not dare to share at least some of them with Lisa. That's when online poker became our solution. Using my knowledge and skills, I created five anonymous accounts on a poker site to strategize the game. All accounts belonged to me, which allowed me to participate in matches against myself, and obviously lose. Of course I had to endure rake deductions from every match, but it was a small price compared to what Lisa could get as a result of a potential divorce settlement. If we had lost all the money to five different players instead of one, it would have looked less suspicious. The site I was playing on was not located in the United States and would hardly have disclosed information about the client. It took a week, but in that time, I managed to empty our bank accounts, leaving only 10,000 on them. Exactly a week later, Lisa called and informed me that she was late at work, which prompted me to contact a private investigator. He assured me that he had the situation under control. This time, when my wife returned home, there was no trace of guilt left. She became more and more adept at infidelity. The next morning, a private investigator called me and told me that he had received the information I was looking for. Wasting no time, I went to his office to pick up the DVD. The private investigator mentioned that he could provide me with a written report within a few days if I wished, but I assured him that the DVD would be enough. After paying him compensation for his services, I assured him that I would contact him if I needed additional help. He expressed regret about the situation, to which I grinned and assured him that he did not need to apologize, since he was not the one who betrayed me. With the DVD in my hands, I returned to work and retired to my office, ordering the assistant not to disturb me. Pressing the play button, I couldn't help but notice the lack of nerves. To tell the truth, I already suspected my wife of infidelity so this revelation will not significantly change anything. Obviously the video was shot with a hidden camera in her lawyer's office and featured impressive image and sound quality. Although I still didn't know about the methods of a private investigator, I didn't care. All that mattered was that I now had what I wanted. Although I had never personally met the man my wife was involved with, a private investigator provided me with a lot of information about him, including his marital status and two children. I was familiar with his parents and the place he called home. 
I knew about the church he attended with his family, but when I saw his size, I noticed that he was no bigger than mine, and maybe even a little smaller. Watching the video, I kept feeling completely detached. I completely lost all emotional attachment to her. I've seen other guys in a similar situation overwhelmed with emotion, wondering why their wives betrayed them. But personally, I was not interested in understanding the reasons for her actions. It was enough for me to just accept that she did it. Interestingly, I noticed that neither his wife nor I were mentioned during their time together. The intimate side was rather unremarkable, but what caught my attention was their conversation about partners in a law firm. This made me curious, and I decided to watch the video. I contacted my boss and explained that I needed a week off to resolve personal issues. Considering our friendly relations, I told him in general terms about the situation and asked him to help replace me. I mentioned that I need to get out of town for a few days. Understanding my circumstances, as he had experienced his ex-wife's infidelity in the past, he showed great empathy. Not only that, he provided me with a list of clients from other states that he thought it would be useful for me to contact. Thus, I had a legitimate reason for being absent from the workplace, and I did not use my vacation time. I left early and hurried back home to pack my suitcase. After contacting my wife, I informed her of an urgent situation involving our client's computer systems outside the state, which required my immediate presence. Although business trips did not happen often, they were not something out of the ordinary for me. She expressed her love to me and wished me a speedy return. I casually mentioned the need to catch a plane, not knowing if she noticed that I did not reciprocate these affectionate words. After flying to another state, I began to implement the next stage of my plan. Taking proactive measures, I diligently reproduced several copies of the video. After that, I carefully placed each copy in a postal package and began to put the appropriate addresses on it. To protect myself from possible connections, I decided to speed up the shipment by forwarding them overnight to an old college friend living on the East Coast. Before that, I contacted him, asking for a favor. In particular, I informed him about an upcoming package, a box that was supposed to arrive the next day. All I asked him to do was just open the package and send each letter, making sure that the postmark indicated their place of departure. I have taken precautions to ensure that my actions remain anonymous and not be tracked. The witnesses confirmed my location and alibi, so I felt it necessary to take such measures. This may seem excessive, but I wanted to make sure that my actions could not be related to me. I made sure to send the video to all the employees of the law firm where Lisa worked, as well as to the wife, parents, and pastor of this asshole's church. I also sent copies to my wife's parents, the preacher at their church, and all her former friends. I managed to find out the address, and I began to share it with our friends. Although some men may feel ashamed when their friends find out about their wife's infidelity, I did not share these feelings. She betrayed her obligations, not me. The final video was sent directly to my home address, and it was accompanied by a selection of amateur sites where I anonymously posted it for everyone to see. As the week went on, the situation began to escalate. Although I do not know all the details, my wife and her lover were called by their employer. After watching the video, my wife was immediately fired from her job. Soon after, she began receiving calls from concerned friends who had seen the video. The situation escalated when her father called, vented his anger on the phone and ordered her to sever all ties with him and her mother. On Friday, several of our friends unexpectedly called me and asked if I knew about the video. Not knowing about the situation due to absence from work, I pretended that I didn't know anything. They enlightened me about the unfolding events, and I was pleased to learn that some of my friends remained faithful, despite my wife's infidelity. When I dialed my home number, a worried Lisa answered the phone. Without wasting any time, I informed her about the calls received from our mutual friends about the video. Feeling obligated to take urgent action, I mentioned that I was heading to the airport preparing to fly home. 
I sternly warned her that if the rumors were really true, then it would be better for her to vacate the premises by my arrival, and advised her to contact a lawyer. To my surprise, by the time I got home she had already left, leaving behind only a few packed things. I later found out that she had taken refuge with a divorced friend, who kindly offered her shelter. Interestingly, this friend went through a divorce due to infidelity. I turned to a lawyer to start the divorce process. I made it clear to Lisa that I did not intend to maintain any personal contact with her and that any communication would take place strictly through our legal representatives. Unfortunately, Lisa's lawyer left much to be desired. He lacked professionalism and honesty. When our situation became public, other lawyers seemed reluctant to contact her, perhaps because of the negative reputation of her former employer. When I told her that our common property was valued at $10,000, she was very upset. But I had enough evidence to support my claim that I had already squandered the rest of our assets in gambling, and this happened before I found out about her infidelity. We had only one asset left our house. Unfortunately, due to the downturn in the real estate market, its sale would lead to losses. It's only been three years since we moved in, but Lisa has never been able to grasp this fact. As a result, she received a court order to sell the house and divide the proceeds. Personally, this decision did not bother me, since I had no intention of staying in the house, especially considering Lisa's unemployment and her inability to pay the mortgage. After selling the house, I had to pay $8,000 to pay off the rest of the mortgage, which significantly reduced our net assets to just $2,000. In addition, Lisa filed for alimony. As a result, it was decided that she was to blame for her unemployment, and as a result she was denied alimony, despite her ability to work. I provided her with a payment of $1,000, but unfortunately she still owed a large sum to her lawyer. Because of her own actions, she found herself in a difficult situation, emotionally broken, deprived of communication and family support. In addition, the scandal surrounding her situation broke out all over the city, which made it impossible for her to continue her employment. Having no other choice, she was forced to move to another state. I threatened the law firm where Lisa worked claiming that they should have known about the affair of two employees who were already married to other people, and that this misconduct took place on the territory of their office during working hours. In the end, I managed to negotiate with the firm for the payment of 300000 which they willingly paid in order to quickly resolve the situation. They were interested in avoiding further negative publicity that could further damage their reputation. In addition to this settlement, I withdrew my funds from the online poker site and managed to get a significant portion of my money back. In general, I came out of this financial situation quite well. Despite my deep desire to have a devoted and affectionate wife, I had to accept that it was not in my power. Over the past few years my knowledge of Lisa has been limited to her role as a hard-working waitress, constantly trying to make ends meet. It seems that whenever she tried to get a better job, the unexpected happened. A copy of her infamous video mysteriously ended up at the company she applied to. Obviously, her infidelity, intimate relationships during working hours, and bad reviews about employers did not bode well for her professional reputation. As for myself, I must admit that I had several casual relationships with some women I knew who offered mutually beneficial terms. Is it possible that I will find love and get married again? Perhaps only time will tell. I come from a family of strong marriages. Both my parents and grandparents had successful and strong partnerships. Perhaps fate will smile on me, and I will be lucky enough to meet the perfect woman. But I want to make it clear from the very beginning that infidelity is not something I put up with, despite the fact that it affected my previous relationship with Lisa.